Hello everyone, welcome to the Energy Source webinar. The Energy Source is a child development center based in Kuala Lumpur, offering early intervention program, assessment and therapy services, day nursery and preschool. This is a pre-recorded webinar. Please sit back, relax, and we hope you enjoy the session. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar um, on biomedical treatment for children with special needs um, with Dr. Deepak Gupta. Um, I'm Joanna. I am the director and a pediatric physiotherapist at the Energy Source in Bangsa, uh, which is a child developmental um, center. So we've been working together with Dr. Malini to kind of bring lots of different webinars on alternative kind of med medical approaches to treatment and management for children with special needs. And biomedicine is obviously um, a big and upcoming area that we're trying to educate people about. Um, so today we have Dr. Molini with us, who I'll let introduce herself. And we have Dr. Gupta from New Delhi as well. Um, just a few kind of ground rules before we start. So if everyone can make sure that they're muted throughout the webinar, just so there's no disruption. And if you have any questions for Dr. Gupta, um, we can have an opportunity at the end to ask him questions, but if it's really urgent, you can just drop it in the chat, either privately to me, and I will, I will keep it confidential and I will ask him, or if you want to drop it to everyone, that's fine as well. So I'll hand over to Dr. Malini, who will introduce herself, and then Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, good evening to all of you who are here on this Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm Malini, a pediatric neurologist here in Kuala Lumpur, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Deepak Gupta. He's a very uh, eminent and leading child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist uh, in New Delhi. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times at conferences, and uh, also uh, recently on my last visit to Delhi, which was in 20, early 2020, yeah, just before the lockdown. Uh, Dr. Gupta, or Deepak as I usually call him, um, he is the director of, uh, of his center, Child and Adolescent uh, Wellbeing, and uh, he's also a consultant at Sir, Sir Gangaram Hospital in Delhi. He does a lot of uh, consults, he's such a busy person, and uh, he's an expert in uh, biomedicine, having been trained with Dan and MAPS, uh, which is Defeat Autism now, and the other one is a special academy for autism uh, from the States. Um, he's uh, very lucky and he's very broad-minded in adopting a holistic approach because as you know many modern doctors are very um, uh, sort of very negative towards uh, the use of complementary and alternative medicines and I'm glad Deepak and I are on the same platform when it comes to this. He's also an expert at trauma counseling and, um, and EMDR and um, I'm quite sure you will learn a lot uh, from him today. We've had inputs uh, from USA through Laurie Knowles and also from UK. And I'm sure uh, Deepak will give you more an Asian perspective, how to get about uh, doing biomedicine. Over to you, Deepak, if you want to say some more about yourself and really look forward to hearing from you today. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Joanna and uh, Dr. Malini for saying those kind words. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, for interacting with you all people. It's my pleasure and uh, to share my experience and my thought process about this field, biomedical treatment for children with special needs. My journey is almost, almost um, I can say around 15 years journey in biomedical. It started all in 2007. 2007, that's the time, almost 14, 15 years back. And since then I've been into biomedical treatment and every child teaches me something. And I've been learning every day in and day out with more and more new protocols coming up. So let's go ahead. Now, biomedical interventions, a new hope for children with special needs. And my focus mostly will be around autism. But yes, this can be applicable to other children with special needs also. An approach from brain to medical disorder. Now, now uh, when I went... Uh, in 2009, for the first time uh, to Dallas, I still remember uh, that time the Dan word was more common, defeat autism now. Then gradually the Dan words was removed because people started having a lot of questions and it was, it became very controversial. And the Autism Research Institute 
was a prominent organization which was working on this area. And for them, it was always that, that autism is treatable and we can defeat autism. And none of these treatments are FDA approved, correct? I really want to make it very clear that none of these treatments are FDA approved. They're alternative treatments. And if you want, you can have a look at some of the recovery videos, www.recoveryvideos.com um, about, about this thing. And if you want to read about it, you can also go to TACA website, T-A-C-A, TACA, T-A-C-A now.org. There also you can learn more about it and understand about the biomedical approaches. So what do you understand by the word biomedical interventions? Biomedical. Now, this is one of the old view. The old view is that, that autism is a brain disorder. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. You need behavior therapy, ABA. You need other therapies. You need drugs, medications, which are only two medications approved by FDA, which is risperidone and eripiprazole. And you group programs and the home programs and the parent training programs. So that is one of the approach which is going on which is followed by most of the people across the world, across the country, where they use ABA therapies, speech language therapies, alternative augmented therapies, your sensory integration, flow time, RDA, RDI, and various pharmacotherapies, as I told you, and the parent training program. That's what. But there's one more approach where the biomedical comes, that autism is a medical disorder. It's a medical disorder in which the gut system, the gastrointestinal issues or the gut system is involved. There's a weak immune system is there. And this gut system and the weak immune system, it impacts the brain. It affects the brain. And then you get the symptoms and signs and symptoms, what we call it, autism spectrum disorder. So the approach changes. So it becomes medical to brain disorder. That means there are medical issues in the gut. Gut brain axis is altered. The immune system is altered. And along with that, the brain gets altered. And then you see the various signs and symptoms, regression, and that is what is called as autism spectrum disorder. Now, this is a very, very important part is immune gut brain access, which I was talking about just now. The brain gut immune. See, this is what is there. And it is a constant overlap. So gut, which is also called as a second brain. If your gut is not right, your brain will be always foggy. And I'm sure, including me, we have experienced that, that if we don't have a good gut or clean gut, we will be irritable, we'll be foggy, we will not be able to concentrate, we'll be a little messy, clumsy, all those things will be there. And that's what is experienced across, 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 the, across the continents. So, so gut, brain, and the immune. So these three things keeps on overlapping. And there's a detoxification system which is going on. So if the gut is detox, immune is detox, system is detox, the brain is detox, then all these gut, brain, and immune remains in a healthy synchronization. But if there's a gut dysbiosis or immune imbalance, then what happens? The brain gets impacted. The neurotransmitters, neurochemicals, the metabolic systems, all that get altered, and that leads to various symptoms and signs, what we call it as autism spectrum disorder, or even some people call it as autisms, A-U-T-I-S-M-S, -S, autisms. Some people call it because no child with autism is same and every child with autism is unique and different and presentation in every child is different. The, the sensory profile, the behavioral profile, the language profile, the cognitive profile, every, every all the aspects of every child is different and unique. That's, that's, that's what is important. So when we follow the biomedical approach, what, what we are doing? So by following the biomedical approach proposed by Autism Research Institute, also called as ARI, you can visit their website also, which is not FDA approved. It gives a hope to parents and believe that autism is treatable and recovery is plausible. Autism is treatable and recovery is plausible. And in last 15 years, since I've been doing biomedical, I have seen so many children coming out of it. I don't say all, but yes, a lot of them come out of it. So again, this is one of the ways of looking at this, that same, which I was talking about, the brain nervous system, the gut immune system. But the question comes, does every child 
gets impacted does every child gets into autism spectrum disorder lot of children have a gut issues lot of children have the immune issues but why certain children are there who develops into autism spectrum disorder or autism and that's where there comes a genetic vulnerability or genetic susceptibility so if there is a genetic susceptibility or genetic vulnerability then those children are prone to get more impact and that is where the concept of epigenetics comes epigenetics and this is one of the theories before i came into this uh, biomedical thing i also used to think why why it's happening i used to have so many children who used to have gut issues immune issues sleep issues you know and when when as i read more and more about epigenetics i got more and more convinced that what is that theory why children do regress why and still if you ask the mainstream doctors about regression most of them will say we don't know we don't know it's idiopathic some may say iatrogenic some may say it most of them will say idiopathic we don't know maybe something may be there but yes we know that lot of children go under regression between the age of 1 to 3 years some 1 to 3 years mostly 95% of regression happen before the age of 3 years only very few rarely it happen by the age of 4 or 5 years but mostly the regression and regression is one of the biggest nightmare for a for any parent whose child is picking up whose child is developing good eye contact developing speech and suddenly by the age of 19 months 20 months 24 months the child becomes slowly withdrawn into his own world poor eye contact and that is where the autism starts entering in parents life and that's what we called as autism spectrum disorder and i can say a big change which i've seen in the last 15 years is that that more and more i'm seeing children of autism regression than non regressive type so so a lot of people ask me is there any difference so children who have non regressive they have more of a genetic high loading they are mostly but children who have a regressive autism and the regressive could be anything it could be language it could be social skills it could be adls activity of daily living or it could be all three or multiple combinations of permutations so any regressive means that there is a environmental insult and that is what i am seeing more and more type of autism regression autism regression so coming to epigenetics that the cause of autism is widely accepted to be strongly genetic so a lot of means everybody mainstream will say it's genetic but the increasing prevalent and we know the numbers are increasing people were talking about 1 in 250 then 1 in 50 1 in 150 then 1 in 100 then 1 in 88 then 1 in 69 then 1 in 58 and of figures even talks about 1 in 54 and it is speculated that by 2030 unfortunately it will be 1 in 10 that is what the speculation is 1 in 10 by 2030 that is what is that so numbers are increasing so with increasing prevalence and recent studies of genetic autism suggest that the cause of autism is also related to gene environment interactions expressed through epigenetic processes now what is this epigenetics now epigenetics is epigenetics mediate the interaction between genes and the environmental factors so genes are intrinsic that is genotype which is biological and the environmental factor it's extrinsic environmental so internal and external this is where it goes on and different different combinations and that is why it is autism spectrum disorder for some children it will be minimal symptoms of autism for some children it will be severe autism severe autism spectrum disorder level 3 so it varies so it is all depends on what is the combination and what is the interaction between the genes and the environmental factor that's what so what happens is that so epigenetics is the study of changes in gene expression that occurs without changes to the dna sequence so what happens the environmental factor leads to the gene expression change in the gene expression and these changes in epigenetic marks can be inherited or they can arise from certain types of environmental exposure when they are inherited it is more of a genetic pure genetic 
and when they arise from certain types of environmental exposure it is more of a regressive type that's what happens so this slide will make it things more clear that rather than talking as a genetic disorder it is more of a genetic susceptibility or genetic vulnerability so what happens with environmental assaults what are those environmental assaults like toxins heavy metal burdens nutritional deficiencies chemical and food sensitivities immune system alteration gi infections inflammation all these toxic exposure and nutrients what happens they alter the biochemical pathways when the biochemical pathways are altered the mitochondrial aspects atp is all altered then it leads to the altering influencing the gene expression and once i they influence the gene expression then we see the symptoms and signs of autism spectrum disorder so gene environmental connection that's what and this slide will make it more clear so the toxins are coming up the multiple toxin deficiencies inside the body of mother and also from the environment all coming up the immune system is poor genetic vulnerability is there and then gradually what happens it keeps on building up building up building up and that inflammation and damage is happening it leads to a point that where the child starts regressing that is called the toxin toxin tipping point ttp so it builds up to that point and then the child gives up the immune system loses the ability to survive leading to the disease manifestations that is what happens so this is the whole thing about epigenetics and the role of one of the con one of the conference which symposium which happened in december 2016 almost 4 years back it talks about that the role of epigenetics in autism spectrum disorder it holds great promise but remains understudied and insufficiently understood in december 2016 the environmental epigenetics of autism spectrum disorder they met more than 30 leaders in autism neurobiology genetics and epidemiology with investigators in the epigenetics of other complex disorder to promote cross disciplinary collaborations and identify opportunities for further studies and what they came out that that this role of epigenetics meet it's a go it holds great promise and we still need to understand more and more about it and i can say the more and more i'm working with these children the more and more i'm able to understand that why a one and a half year old child goes into regression and if you see the whole trajectory from childhood you can come to know you can come to know how the multiple factors adds to it if you take a good history you will see that how during the pregnancy just before the pregnancy during the pregnancy after delivery delivery history breastfeeding history the first one year the various complications the various physical illnesses including gut issues gastric abnormalities all those keeps on adding adding the immune alteration and that adds on and finally with immunization finally the child goes into what you see and regressive type of autism so let's more go more into more um uh, um uh, complex uh, understanding of this whole phenomena if you see this slide from top to bottom the level 1 2 3 4 4 the level 1 is a phenotype on the surface and level 1 is a genotype hardcore mrna dna so what happens when you do therapies various therapies so you're working at level 4 and 3 when you're giving medications you're working at level 4 and 3 mostly sometimes you're able to test level 2 when you're doing the biomedical approach you're working on level 3 and level 2 deeper into it neuromodulator physiological process cell modulation but still we have not been able to reach, reach to level 1 so we still need more understanding and more depth to want to go to the level 1 and if we are, if we will be able to reach level 1 that will be almost like resulting into gene modification gene modification so deeper into level 3 and 2 are the focus of biomedical therapy this part now so the middle earth this middle earth of level 2 and 3 is a target of biomedical therapy in autism and entails various active bio biochemical or physiological process such as falling like gut dysbiosis that's the first important step anybody who wants to do biomedical intervention with his child 
or any therapist who is attending today's lecture please make sure first heal the gut before you go into any advanced bio biomedical uh, interventions if your gut is not in place your chelation your heavy metal your methylation everything will fall apart so make sure heal the gut heal the gut and heal the gut that's the golden rule in biomedical interventions and that's where a lot of articles are coming about gut brain axis gbb gut brain axis or microbiota gut brain axis mgbb so work on that part so so gut gut dysbiosis immune abnormalities inflammation impaired detoxification processes heavy metal issues oxidative stress disturbed methylation mitochondrial dysfunction and excitatory inhibitory imbalances so all these are what you called is that level 2 and 3 this is the part this is the part now such abnormal epigenetic processes are not found in all people with asd that's why every child is different so some people may more have a gut dysbiosis some people may more have more of heavy metal issues a lot of children who comes to me their gut are absolutely fine around 20 to 30% of children will be there whose gut will be healthy absolutely fine around 50 to 70% or 50 to 80% of children will have gut issues will have gut issues so please take a good care of gut and take a good history about the gut that's important so this is everything in a whole about the biomedical if you see correct all everything inflammation oxidative stress mitochondrial disturbed methylation excitotoxicity immune free fatty all this sir and you know what is this in between this is the gut this is important this is the gut and everything around it so we need to heal this gut along with this working on these multiple factors these are the various biomedical this is just the picture view about it so we need to clean up the gut the gi issues once we clean up then we have to go to various steps like methylation nutritional support fungus virus neuroinflammation detox oxidative stress immune system so these are just a just just a pitch, pictorial representation to make things more easy the three r's are most important the three r's what are those three r's the first r is you remove and eliminate toxins so remove what is harming the body and what do you remove you remove the refined sugars refined oils refined flours processed food packaged foods pesticides plastics microwaves mobiles monitors and certain specific diets like gluten free casein free soya free sugar free corn free and other specific diets so once you remove so everything is there even the even the paint in your house they all contains heavy metal like lead the paint has to be organic paints organic paint has to be organic food has to be encouraged if the food is organic with no pesticides encourage glass ceramic mud all those uh, you know vessels everything that's very very important so removing all the toxins that's what i say you need to dry clean your house the first basic step that's very very important you need to look into the places where the mold is there because mold is very very common in the house especially in the humid countries the mold is very very common so you remove you need to remove the mold for that you can use apple cider vinegar vinegar is very very good you can use the vinegar for that that's very very important so remove the molds remove your microwaves aluminum foils no aluminum foils no plastic wraps so you you need to work in your kitchen your kitchen is a laboratory so you need to work on the kitchen and make sure your kitchen does not have any toxic stuff from aluminum foils from plastic wraps from plastic vessels no microwaves everything is there you're using no teflon no 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 pressure cooker i don't know how much people use pressure cooker in that part but yet in india the pressure cookers are there in which aluminum is there aluminum is there a lot of teflon is used the non stick wares so all those things have to be used the vegetable fruits make sure they are organic wash them properly before you use them so all this is the first part remove and eliminate toxins that's very very important that thing is that so this is the important thing is that and 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 in and second important step is 
replenish the nutrients. How do we replenish the nutrients? By correct deficiencies, by supplementing nutrients, vitamins and minerals. And that's where you need to do lab work. Laboratory work is important to see whether it's iron deficiency, whether it's a magnesium deficiency, selenium deficiency, copper deficiency, whether it's molybdenum deficiency. So you need to identify those deficiencies. That's, that's very important. And once you identify those deficiencies, then you correct those deficiencies. Also, one more thing which I've learned over the years that wherever, whichever part of the country you are, make sure you eat fresh seasoned vegetables. The fresh seasoned vegetables are the best thing. So if, if the season is for mango, eat mango. If the season is for watermelon, eat watermelon. So make sure you eat seasoned vegetables and fruits with a lot of nuts, seeds, dry fruits, and keep on rotating them. Keep on rotating them. That's important. So you make sure you get all the yellow ones, the red ones, the green ones, all are well taken care of. So our body needs red also, green also, yellow also. We need all sort of fruits and vegetables. That's very, very important. Correct? That's one thing. Make sure if you're, if you're meat eating people or if you eat take meat, make sure the eggs are organic. The meat is organic. It's fresh and processed. It's fresh. It's not processed. Correct? So avoid processed meats. Have fresh halal meats, which is, which is like a fresh ones. That's very, very important. Correct? So that is also important part is there. Even the dairy, the milk, make sure the milk is, again, as much as possible organic or if, if it's possible. So all those things are very, very important to get a good nutrients. The third most important part is, which is a hardcore biomedical is, once you've removed the toxins, you've replenished the nutrients, then you have to restore the functions. And that is how do you, you heal the gut by probiotics. Lot of evidence is coming about probiotics. Lot of evidence from 10 to 10 to 30 billion or 10 to 50 billion or 10 to 100 billion and rotate, rotating the probiotics, digestive enzymes, treating the dysbiosis, constipation. Constipation is very too common, too common in these children. And if they have gut issues, they will get up in the middle of the night, they will cry, they will be cranky, they'll be irritable, a lot of head banging, a lot of biting will be there, restless, pacing up, all this. You heal the gut, they'll settle down. Antifungal, anti clostridial treatment. So heal the gut. You treat the metabolic problems, mitochondrial dysfunction, very, very common. When the child goes into regression, they have mitochondrial dysfunction, not disorder, mitochondrial dysfunction. They have immune dysfunction, increase the immune system, improve their oxidative stress, a lot of antioxidants, very, very important. And then gradually you work on the detox system. So you never go on to the detox system directly. You remove the toxins, you replenish the nutrients, you heal the gut, you treat the metabolic problems, the methylation issues, oxidative stress, immune system, mitochondrial dysfunction, and then you go to the detox system, which is also called as chelation or removing the heavy, heavy metals. So these are some of the various uh, blood tests which can be done depending on the availability and the cost factor. Multiple like blood counts, thyroid function tests, iron ferritin, zinc calcium, everything has a purpose. If you see everything, if you're getting a thyroid function test because it can mimic some of the symptoms of autism and impaired development. If you're doing ferritin and iron because it can lead to sleep problems and attention concentration. So every test has a purpose. If you're doing vitamin A, why? Because vitamin A supplementation has shown to improve eye contact and visual symptoms. If you're doing cysteine, because it can lead to oxidative stress. If you're doing ASO and anti-DNS antibodies, we're trying to reward pandas because if they're a child, suddenly you see the behavior becomes chaotic and suddenly start having involuntary movements like tics and, and very aggressive sleep problems along with involuntary movements with sore throat, always suspect pandas. That's very, very important. Magnesium, usually very, very good to calming agent. It calms down and it lower and, and usually in autism children, it's lower levels are found. That's very important. Don't forget this vitamin B12, folic and homocysteine. Very, very important, especially for speech and language. One of the major concerns for which parents comes to me is that the child is improving, the behavior has become better, but the child does not have a speech. And we know at least 50% of children with autism have a speech issues. Some people say even, even till 70%, but yes, 
speech and language issues is a big issue in children with autism spectrum disorders mitochondrial speech in regression or if a child is having multiple regressions that means the child regressed at the age of one and a half years and then the child started improving but again he regresses then he improves again he regresses that is multiple regression please work on the mitochondria and we just need simple coq10 and l carnitine that's all along with little bit of riboflavin and a peef and pentothenic acid that's good enough and this really really works very well organic acid panels food intolerance allergy this is very very important they are expensive test some of them are very expensive like food intolerance and food allergy but yes various food allergens we, we lot of time what happens when you tell to the parents do gluten free casein free they are not convinced when you do this test and then they see the reports they get convinced and when you remove them and i have seen so many children when you remove this when you get these tests done food intolerance food allergy and you remove all of them the child starts improving in his behavior in his gut in his sleep problems that's what the stool testing porphyrin concentration neoptrin for the inflammation oxidized dna rna isoprostein so these are so many tests are there so these are some of the few tests which i have i've written out here but yes some of them can be there still a lot of tests are there and one more test which i have not uh, i i i think i forgot to tell you is this one heavy metal test lead very very important lead is very very make sure every child is tested for the lead at least lead and if if they can afford if the cost is not an issue hair metal test also because that has been seen to contribute to autism behavior in some children a few children who have recovered from autism it's only because they have been able their heavy metal profile was well taken care of their lead level was 25 30 35 in the in the blood and now they are 2 3 1 1 and we have seen remarkable improvement in them they have been able to go to the mainstream at school so this is very very important part so so up till now i have covered about what is biomedical approach and what is the rational about biomedical approach then i have also talked about the various laboratory test and i have also told i have also mentioned about the 3 rs now slightly i'll go into little bit into uh, details of the biomedical now the first thing is that you heal the gut as i told you and how do you heal the gut by diet as i told you about organic dieting removing the food additives colorings preservatives and that all improves hyperactivity concentration that's very very important gfc of diet it improves in certain autism behaviors such as isolation communication and overall behavior around 70% of them improve specific carbohydrate carbohydrate diet scd especially children who have bowel inflammation diarrhea gut dysbiosis which is not improving 72% improves body ecology diet fain gold diet low oxalate diet this is very very important especially children with high oxalate issues you know that is very very important thing that so these are the figures you can do and sometimes when you do the food allergy intolerance test and you find that you remove the eggs chocolate sugars rotation diet around 50% of children show improvement so my basic golden principle is that the first thing whenever the child comes to me i remove their sugar processed package and preservative stuff i remove all the sugars refined sugars correct so i tell them so free sugar free corn free at least to start with and then gradually i go to no dairy no wheat if they if they are if they are if they are ready to go ahead with gfcf diet and then gradually if they're open to it and if they're not improving much then i go to body ecology or specific carbohydrate diet carbohydrate diet and there's one more diet called gaps gut abnormal psychology syndrome diet and that is also slightly a, a modified version of scd so if anybody is interested can i have a look at that now along with the diet we need to give that enzy enzymes because a lot of children have a reduced ability to digest food so asking one simple history that that does the poo contains undigested food if the poo contains undigested food 
enzymes is one of the helpful stuff. Give them digestive enzymes and they will improve. That's very, very important. Also, a lot of times, enzymes can be a savior. How? They are on GFCF diet, but they take gluten. Whenever they take gluten, the child becomes restless and hyperactive. That is the time you can give certain enzymes which can neutralize or buffer the, the, the gluten or phenols. So various enzymes are available. And one of the companies, which is a is Houston, Houston enzymes or Kirkman, you can, you can always look into that. Now this, as we said about that enzymes, probiotics to improve digestion and gut brain activities. And, and there's a lot of probiotics are there, usually 30 to 50 billion or 30 to 70 billion or 30 to 100 billion. So always start with 10 to 20 billion and then gradually keep on rotating, keep on rotating. That's the important thing with that. Now you see this, that, that, that what we are doing with GFCF diet, we are working on this dietary proteins and peptides. And the infections part, we need to still address because all this starts in the gastrointestinal tract and then it affects the immune system and then it manifests in the brain. Now, and once what happens, once this gluten goes into the body, gluten casein, it starts opening up the tight junction in the gut. This all is a gut lining. And then these proteins, which breaks into peptides, it enters into circulation, blood circulation. And from there, it goes to the brain. It binds to the various receptors. And then it causes a brain dysfunction. So this is where. So this is where the food comes. And this is where the autism comes. So if we need to prevent this GFCF diet or avoiding soya, corn, sugar, because these are the chemicals which impairs the development of these children. That's very, very important. So, so and there's an autoimmune reaction. So when we stop this, the autoimmune reaction is prevented. That's a very important thing. There's one more protocol called Nemchek protocol, which helps in healing the gut. It's quite common these days, quite prevalent. That's why I, I, that's why I want to just briefly mention about this. It's also called as NP, Nemchek protocol by Dr. Nemchek. The first step is inulin, which is a prebiotic. The step two is DHA EPA, the fish oil. The step three is avoid omega-6 in cooking oils. So you need to stop all the cooking oils which contains omega-6. You can give oils which is omega-3 and omega-9. Omega-9 is usually olive oil and omega-3 is usually the ghee, the ghee and mustard oil. They are rich in omega-3. Correct? Omega and step four is daily supplementation with extra virgin olive oil. It could be any company. It could be California. It could be Apollo. It could be any different, different companies are there. What's the important thing is that. So to reduce the systematic inflammation. And what happens when you give inulin, it balances the intestinal bacteria. And this omega-3, along with omega-9, it reduces the brain and systematic inflammation. So the gut also heals, and there's a brain and systematic, systematic and the brain inflammation also reduces. And then what happens is induction of neuroplasticity. This is most important. That is where the NEMCHA protocol works. But again, be careful in the inulin. Sometimes when you start inulin, it can backfire. The child can become more aggressive. So start with the lowest possible dose, one eighth, one sixteenth, and then go slowly, slowly, slowly. And sometimes when inulin doesn't work, you need to give, go, you need to start rifaximin, 200 to 550 milligram, twice a day or thrice a day, depending on the child and the body weight. That's what. Sometimes inulin does not work at all. And sometimes children do very well on rifaximin, 200 milligram twice a day, or 400 milligram twice a day, or 550 milligram twice a day, they do marvelous. But you, but you can't do, you can't, you have, sometimes you have to give for 10 days and give a break and then repeat again after a month. Now coming to those infections. So we are still talking about the gut. So these infections, what are the signs of that parasites could be there? These are the signs, bizarre behavior, especially fecal smearing, playing with the fe fecal material, Fecal smearing, that's very, very common. That means parasites. Insatiable appetite, increased appetite, aggressive, worsening at the full moon. 
and by good history, picking, biting, licking, itching, and grinding, especially anal itching, restlessness, all these says it could be parasites. And you can do a CDSA test. Clostridia, aggressive, temper, agitate, agitation. But along with that, very foul smelling stools, mucus and stools, and severe diarrhea following antibiotics. Again, organic acid test or microbiota, microbiota oat. Strep, strep, this repetitive ritualistic, verbal tics, obsessive, compulsive, verbal stimming, frequent, step to, fre frequent infections, frequent bacterial infections. You should always get the pandas tested. East and candida, very, very common, very, very common, foggy thinking, spacey, inappropriate laughter, sugar craving, frequent diaper rash, frequent urination, history of frequent antibiotics and night awakening. This is very, very common, very, very common. Always address East and candida. You can get it picked up by organic acid test and viruses, especially if there is history of regression after MMR or other live viruses, cold sores, warts, poor eye contact, squinting, divergent gaze, easy fitting and visual issues. So if the yeast overgrowth, what we do, we give anti yeast diet, like limit the sugar, probiotics, like Saccharomyces boulardii, zinc, molybdenum, capillary acid, MCT liquid, coconut oil, oil of oregano, coconut kefir, turmeric, garlic, so grapeseed extract, antifungal drugs like nystatin and fluconazole, if it is available in your country. In India, I use mostly fluconazole or voriconazole. Nystatin is not easily available to us. For clostridia, again, lactobacillus, remnants, saccharomyces, various diets, thyme, cumin, bay leaf, and even metronidazole and vancomycin can be used. These are the various, now coming to the nutritional deficiencies, as, we, as I was talking about, the second R, by giving vitamin C to reduce stereotypical behaviors, zinc, especially to improve attention, and tiptoe, tiptoe walking, magnesium vitamin C, but again, for improving social interaction, hyperactivity, communication, that's very, very common. Iron, sleep problems, concentration, pica, very, very common in children. Vitamin A, especially visual, visual peripheral vision, immune system, so vitamin A, and the vitamin A have a different, different protocols are there. Vitamin D to boost the immune system and tetrahydrobiopterin to improve the social behavior. Cholesterol. A lot of the children have a low cholesterol. They have 120, 110, 130, 90, 100. The cholesterol should be around 150 to 170. And we know the good amount of brain is made up of cholesterol. So if cholesterol is low, then the brain will not develop adequately. So increase the cholesterol in the diet. That's very, very important. And also there's one company which makes cholesterol tablets also, but yes, by increasing the egg yellow and by increasing certain foods, which increase the cholesterol, you can increase the cholesterol levels. Omega-3 fatty acids, the mitochondrial support, carnitine CoQ10, tryptophan and 5-hydroxy tryptophan, especially for rocking, toe walking, pacing, self-abuse, flapping, melatonin, Especially for sleep problems, very, very common sleep issues, one to six milligrams per day. L carnosine, piracetam. So, depending on that, the reports, you need to put the certain supplements. Certain pharmacological agents are also used in biomedical, like low dose naltrexone, usually three to five milligrams, especially to reduce the self injurious behavior. And how does low dose, low dose naltrexone work? It works on the opioid system, it works on the endogenous opioid system. Oxytocin, the social hormone, the love hormone, it improves socialization. If you are able to procure from USA, from other countries, by giving spray, one spray or two spray, 10 to 40, 10 to 40 international units per day. Mementamine, improve social behavior language, especially apraxia, verbal apraxia, five to 20 milligram per day. It works on the NMDA receptors and immune therapies and various other medications. Now, one of the important thing which I really like in biomedical is methylation support. Oh, sorry. Is a methylation support. And how do you start with the methylation support? In ev almost every child, I, I try to add methyl support. Because, because usually children with autism spectrum disorder or regression, the methylation support is required. But some children were over methylated. For that, we need to do advanced testing or either we give the supplement and see the response. 
in those children they can have they they, they, they their behavior can be, become chaotic when you give methyl molecules so methyl b12 is a vital cofactor for metabolic pathways involving transmethylation and transsulfuration so i want to show you this slide if you see this is where the all methyl molecule works so methylene tetrahydrofolate which become methylene tet tetrahydrofolate and here the methyl molecule goes to the to form methionine and here we need b12 and mthf along with methyl b12 gets converted into methionine and then to sm s adenosyl methionine and here the methyl molecule goes into the system for forming dna protein phospholipids amino acid neurotransmitter but if this does not happen then all this part gets blocked that's why methyl b12 is very very important and sometimes along with methyl b12 we need to even give glycine see plain glycine or methyl or dimethyl glycine or trimethyl glycine which is also called a dmg or tmg and then what happens the whole system starts working if this system won't work then this system gets blocked and this system leads to glutathione which is one of the most powerful antioxidant in the body so how do we give methyl mb12 it's administered at doses of 64.5 to 75 microgram per kg with subcutaneous injections every second to third day it improves in social interaction language and increase concentration of gsh glutathione it helps in that so we have done few studies about this mb12 and we have also published few studies but one of the landmark work which was done by dr newbrander james newbrander effective in 72% of children uh, a survey which was published in ar in 2009 and in last 10 years or almost 12 13 years we have given more than 500 to 600 children has been given mb12 injection trials one of the studies which we published in 2013 in one of the asian conference of 75 children what we saw we saw that 72% children had improvement in speech and language 61% children improved in sociability 57% children in sensory and cognitive awareness and 53% in health and physical behavior only four children were there who did not show any significant change in their behavior and we stopped mb12 injections so mb12 injections are very promising modality along with mb12 injections to support methylation we can give folate it can be methyl folate it can be folic acid or folinic acid but usually i give methyl folate or folinic acid the active version of this thing and also a lot of evidence coming for leucovorin high dose of folinic acid in a dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg body weight and i have seen good results in speech and language dimethyl glycine and trimethyl glycine again for speech nac riboflavin vitamin b6 zinc magnesium choline glycine and creatine all that supports methylation cycle now coming to chelation briefly i know we are already uh it's quite a long time i've been speaking but yes i am in the last part of my presentation the chelation very very controversial people are scared about it but let me tell you don't get scared it is helpful provided you do it adequately and properly chelation has been used in treating asd based on the theory that autism spectrum disorder is caused by heavy metal toxicity the hypothesized accumulation of heavy metal would presumably be caused by the body's inability to clear the heavy metals by increased exposure of both why it is important because we are living in a toxic world we are living in a toxic world and we are continuously exposed by whatever we eat whatever we smell whatever we inhale whatever we wear everything we are exposed by that through the heavy metals that's why the first step is very very important dry clean your house clean your house that's important now when you work on the detoxification it also requires as i told you clearing the gut to harmful remove the harmful dysbiotic flora and bolster the metabolism with essential nutrient and then you have to go to the chelation these are some of the heavy uh, some of the medicines which are used but to make things simple let me tell you about the various chelation protocols there are natural chelation also the low dose protocols also there is proper chelation also some people who are scared about medication they just do natural chelation 
like vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin D6, zinc, selenium, glutathione, <clears throat> 500 to 1000 milligram per day. There are some detox smoothies. Some of, some of the patients who are under my care, they've tried detox smoothies. You can just type detox smoothie. You will get, you will get the full recipe. <clears throat> it is a various combination of cilantro, green apple, chlorella, and coconut water. Now there's a low dose ACT protocol. It is called ND Cutler Chelation Protocol. ND Cutler Chelation Protocol. So the golden principle is that because the chelation medical, chelation medicines can sometimes backfire to start with the ultra low dose. And what are those ultra low dose? One eighth or one half milligram per pound. But the only thing is that you have to give three days on and four days off on the weekend. And you use BMSA or ALA or ALA plus DMSA. If you are suspecting lead and others, then you give DMSA. If you're suspecting only mercury, you give ALA. If you're suspecting both, you give DMSA and ALA both on different, different combination. <clears throat> the full protocol is available and you can do, and ideally you should do under the supervision of a doctor. And then there's proper chelation, EDTA, DMSA, DMPS, penicillamine. All this works and there are various preparations are available. Some people do it oral, some people do transdermal, rectal, IV. I do all of them except the IV. I don't do IV chelation, but I do oral, transdermal, rectal. I do ACC protocol. And I also believe in natural chelation. So I do all of them. So, but yes, it has to be under a proper supervision. Now coming to the last part, one of the last part, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Again, I've been using for more than almost uh, nine years, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It is based on the belief that autism involves Reduce CNS perfusion and neuroinflammation. Children are placed with a parent into a chamber for 40 sessions. In the chamber, the child breathes 100% pure oxygen at greater than atmospheric pressure, more than 1.3, 1.5, which allows a greater diffusion of oxygen in the cells and thereby decrease the inflammation and the blood supply in the brain. That's important. We have been doing at a center and what we have found is that around 45% of children the speech, language, and communication improves. 60% sociability improves, 50% sensory and cognitive awareness, and 50% have health and physical behavior improves. So Edgeward is a promising. So all these interventions are promising, but none of them is cure. They're all treatment. Some of the new therapies, modalities, which has come up in the pipeline are the CBD oil. The CBD oil, which is very, very, is, is quite now is there. But still, we, yes, we need more evidence about it. A lot of studies are going on. How CBD oil helps? Realization of sleep pattern. Reduced uh, aggression. Here's Better... what I found. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It helps in regularization of sleep pattern. Reduce aggression. Better school performance. Reduce tantrums. Reduce sensory features and improvement in gut issues. And it all depends on. So here, what we are doing is that we, we need to give the right doses in the child. That's very important is there. Now, another thing which is new coming is uh, Belovaptin, which is a vasopressin receptor antagonist. And still studies are coming up which show significant improvement in social interaction and communication and fecal transplant. As I told you, gut is very, very important. And some of the children don't respond to any intervention and fecal transplant has been found to be promising in those children. Two, three studies have come and what they found in 2017 and 2019 study that 24% improvement of symptoms and two years after the treatment, only 17% had severe autism. Only 17% had severe autism as compared to 83% prior to starting of treatment, which is a big, big figure. So we need more studies to support this maybe more and more promising interventions are coming up. I hope that they stand the, they stand the time and I'm sure this will really help a lot of, lot of children with gut issues. So in the end, autism is a very complex disorder and involves many genetic and environmental factors that are not well understood. However, there are many biomedical abnormalities that have been identified 
and most can be treated to some degree. But remember one thing, many individuals will improve to some degree, usually slowly and steadily over months and years. Sometimes one treatment shows greater benefit, but it is more common that each treatment helps a small amount. However, the cumulative effect of multiple treatment can be substantial. One of the teachers who is one of the pioneers in the USA, Dr. Dan Rosignol, he taught me that small, small potatoes make a big potato. So it can be gut, then metabolic, then oxidative, then methylation, and then finally detox. So small, small potatoes makes a big potato. Much of the, most, much of the research on biomedical interventions has focused on children. Research is needed to understand the effectiveness on teenagers and adults on autism spectrum, but it seems likely that many of the treatment listed here will also be helpful, helpful to teens and adults. In the end, I'll say it's an holistic pat platter which combined individual approach with therapies. More awareness is required. We need to learn and train ourselves and training is available. Thank you very much. Thank you Vipak, for that elegant uh, presentation. Uh, you took us through a lot of uh, basic steps, which I think was very important to newcomers uh, who sometimes are confused how to start, when to start. I know you've given us a very broad overview and you've covered a lot of uh, good steps, but I hope uh, people have understood and you really presented it very well. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, on the local scene, I mean, there are a few of us here who are into biomedical medicine. Um, I'm talking about the mainstream doctors and uh, two, well, one of them does psych has got psychiatric background and the other two are general pediatricians. So there are not very many of us for such a big population. And um, we try to do some of those tests that you mentioned, uh, but a lot of it has to go to the states mostly. Um, so especially the uh, urine organic testing, hair, metals, uh, food allergy tests are available locally. Um, um, yeah, those are some of the basic things that, that I do, but like routine biochemistry, uh, like uh, liver function tests, uh, renal function tests, those basic uh, and nutritional profile that can be done locally. But then when you look at the cost of, of just doing all these tests, it is really um, prohibitive for most families. So um, yeah, so the, I think it's important to do the test rather than just embark on a whole slew of uh, nutritional supplements. Because at least if you understand the tests, why are we doing all these supplements? Why are we doing uh, nutritional chelation? You have to show proof that the metals are high in the hair and in the blood. Um, you've got nutritional deficiencies and you have to take them through a step-by-step -step approach. But it's very hard to do uh, when you don't have a big team to work with. And uh, like I said, it will be good to have a, a holistic approach, with the nutritionists on board, with the psychiatrists on board. It's very, it's very difficult because each one of us tend to work alone. So educating the masses, it's so important. Okay. I have a question for you in the chat. So in a world of ever-growing technology dependence, where high radio frequencies, screens and devices are helpful and needed, are there any treatment options or alternative homeopathy that can shield us through various diets that could help us while still maintaining the use of the devices? Uh, see, the, there are, uh, the best thing is that, that I know that we are, we are highly loaded on the technology. So important thing is that, that we should be careful about how much we are using technology, one. Second, we should have a regular breaks of technology. But third, if still we are using it, then make sure that we are using certain precautions. We are taking certain precautions while we're using technology. So if we take certain precautions are there, along with that, various companies have certain those shield, those guards are there, which can be stick to the mobiles and, and various things are the chips are there, which can be added to it to reduce, to minimize the frequency. Coming about the diet, absolutely, as I told you about that initially, that increase your diet to the point that your oxidative stress does not increase much. If your oxidative stress is high, definitely all those things will impact you. And that is where you need to work on a diet. As I told you, as much as organic possible, take care of the water, dry clean your, your kitchen, look into your kitchen aspects, the molds in the house. Important is what you eat, eating outside, 
avoiding preservative processed packaged foods so if you are able to rotation of the season vegetables so if you are able to take care of that good diet that's very very important so and some people have tried different different like some people go to vegan directly some people have, they have stopped gluten when some people stop gluten they see a difference so when they stop gluten you know completely they have seen that they are more that they they, they they feel that yes they 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 can see a difference in themselves in their own themselves but yes it's worth trying person to person but there's no one particular diet to say that but no one particular diet to say that it will shield you from the electromagnetic frequency or radiations we are living in a such a toxic world and we are constantly exposed to electromagnetic frequency radiation so we need to make ourselves strong from inside that's what is important Okay, I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. Okay, any other questions before we close up? Uh, a million dollar question for you, Deepak. What are your views on vaccines? Uh, because there are a lot of uh, parents nowadays who are anti-vaxxers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not a big fan of vaccines. Uh, but living in a country like India, yeah, there's so many infections are there. So... So when people ask me, I always say, get the essential ones if you really want to put a child. So, if you really want to put a child onto it, get the essential ones, and if you can avoid the extra add-ons or the cosmetic vaccines, avoid them. But if your first child had a vaccine injury, which is difficult to prove, but a lot of parents say that my child was fine till for eighteen, nineteen months, and when he got MMR. he regressed then i say in second child be careful or usually they all they themselves only don't uh, go ahead with the vaccine till the age of 3 years by the age of 3 to 4 years as the system has got developed then after that you can give important ones if required so usually my stay is that in a punch line that only give essential ones and give one vaccine at a time and if if you give another vaccine make sure there's enough gap between the vaccines and avoid trivalent and pentavalent yeah. but it's impossible to get monovalent vaccines nowadays i know that that's why a lot of times it's a big load on some of the children and some of the children are not able to tolerate now we don't know which child will be not will go into regression after vaccine we don't know we still don't have a test but only thing is that if the first child has developed a vaccine injury you can avoid the second child if you want to or important thing is that is that you can delay it you can delay the vaccine yeah but um, i don't know about in india but nowadays our vaccines don't come them don't uh, are not available as single vaccines you can't get just pure measles vaccine they all like five in one six in one absolutely and that is why when the load becomes so much on the body some yeah. of the children are not who are genetic genetic susceptible they're not able to tolerate and they go into a what is also called as vaccine injury which is a quite lot of people don't buy this concept of vaccine injury but if you see pros and cons in a country like us where you need to have for tb for diphtheria dpt for other things polio then the pros always goes for the vaccination but yes a lot of parents have clearly mentioned and they've gone through the vaccine injury and we have seen the children have regressed after the vaccines and gone into autism spectrum disorder this one question about uh, the um, diet you know which diet you prefer to start on do you begin with nemchek or the gaps or the uh, so the first the first i always start with what is your approach here my my first thing is that is sugar free corn free and soya free the first second if they open then i immediately go for gluten free and casein free so you don't do it the other way around which one uh, milk free uh, wheat free first milk free first no the point is that that the the, way, the place we are living into it the country we are living with is highly loaded with gluten there's so much gluten is consumed in the part where i live in north india so the point is that i usually say if the parent is open for it i always say go for gluten free casein free yeah but sometimes parents are not open for it but ideally if i need to choose one thing i'll always go for gluten free casein free soya free sugar free and corn free but if the parents are reluctant you start with milk free because when you start the milk free within one or two weeks you start seeing the improvements 
when you stop the milk within a week the milk goes out of the system within a week as the milk goes out of the system the child's eye contact becomes better he is more settled his stomach becomes better so the the parents also get convinced the diet is working yeah corn is not a staple diet in malaysia so we don't have that issue unlike in north india yeah so if you have to pick up one diet i'll say go for the milk free first yeah definitely then definitely. go for the gluten free yeah because that really makes a difference because gluten takes 1 to 3 months to get out of the system but milk takes only 1 1 to 2 weeks to get out of the system so i have seen children when they stop the milk immediately within 1 to 2 weeks their gut become better the eye contact becomes better they are more settled down and you start seeing the in, in, uh, improvements and they, they they start understanding the biomedical approach better Okay, there's one more question, doctor, before we close. So, in an adult with ADD or ADHD that was progressed through childhood, would there be a different or alternative approach that could help better the progress? In a child, the brain is more malleable, so diet and lifestyle can be changed. What steps could be taken for an adult that is more fixed or rigid? I guess. In adults, also, I've always seen the best approach is first start with the gut. but the only problem come as she's right to work on the diet with an adult is very difficult they don't want to do gluten free they want sugar they want processed foods it's difficult but still i'll say try to convince your adult can try to convince your adult child or a teenager that this is something harming you for that the blood test is very good once you get the blood test you can show to your teenager or the adult person see the gluten is sensitive casein is sensitive sugar is this there once they see the reports they get more convinced and then you can roll the ball on so again i'll say start with the gut and then gradually as per the blood reports and the blood work go for the nutritional deficiencies and then correct the other systems like metabolic oxidative stress system immunological system and if and methylation system and if required immunological system the doses will change the doses what will be there in the childhood will be different doses dosages will be there that is what i have seen but yes if the adult is compliant it still it works in if if it works in adults but you're right it takes more time because the brain is already fixed yeah so the next question is what about yogurt isn't it a good probiotic yes your gold gut is a yeah, yogurt is a very good probiotic it's a it's very helpful i am i'm i'm big fan of uh, pro, uh, um, uh, the yogurt but is that is some people are too sensitive to milk and if you are doing casein free diet or dairy free diet you need to remove the yogurt but some children are there who are tolerant to casein but they are able to tolerate homemade yogurt homemade plain yogurt without sugar without anything no no flavored they are able to tolerate yogurt in that case or mm-hmm. some people who are not able to take cow or buffalo milk yogurt they are able to take camel milk yogurt they are no. able to take other other milk yogurts also yes. better to get a food allergy and food intolerance test done even you allow homemade uh, cow's milk or buffalo milk uh, yogurt is it no usually if you are doing if you are doing a casein free no yeah yeah if you are doing a casein free mm. if you are doing 100% casein free no no homemade except the ghee the ghee you know the ghee that uh, where, uh, the when you make this fat yeah yes, yes absolutely mm-hmm. so you that that is allowed because when you prepare that ghee the whole casein goes away in your nem check protocol uh, you mentioned about ghee and mustard oil uh, why not uh, oli- uh, sorry coconut oil the co- even coconut oil is allowed i just mentioned them that they are good source of omega 3 Do you prefer to start the Nemchek protocol as your first line kind of diet? No, never, never, never. I will never go for the Nemchek first time unless the parent is ready for it. Yeah. Because if the parent is not ready for Nemchek, when you start the insulin, it backfires in lot of children. Mm. And it is very difficult to a lot of times it backfires and some and also it's very difficult to get the good source of olive oil in country in India. So what happens? You insulin is easy to get, omega three is easy to get. You you can stop omega six, but you should have a good omega nine olive oil. Correct. If you don't have a good omega nine omega uh, olive oil, 
which is either Dr. Nemchek's brand or or uh, your California Gold or Apollo. You know that that should be of good quality. Unless you don't have that one, it's very difficult. So you are so what what you end up is that you are only able to give the one part of Nemchek protocol. You are not able to do completely. So Nemchek protocol is not my first line. Unless the parent is ready. There's one person asking where they can get a food intolerance test done, and I, I'm assuming they're based in Malaysia. But if I'm wrong, please put it in the chat. So I know Dr. Malini does food intolerance testing via Pantai. Okay, sorry, they're in India, so I'm not sure which part. Yeah, um, it, it can be done from uh, multiple laboratories. <laughs> multiple laboratories uh, does it uh, across. I'm from Chennai, actually. Chennai, yeah. so Chennai. Yeah, you, can, you can easily get it done from, you know, either Lal Pet Labs or, uh, or Ready Gear. They both they does it. Okay. Okay, I hope that helps. So I think we better um, wrap up now since we've kind of run over time a little bit. So if anyone has any questions that they think of last minute, um, please do email um, Dr. Gupta. I'm sure he'll be happy to help. Or if you want to have a consultation with him, you can email him as well. Or Dr. Malini is also available in Malaysia. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, it was super informative and very grateful for it, your information. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to know more about our services or would like to book an appointment with one of our specialists, please email us or give us a call at the following information.